I actually cannot believe I might have to wait another year to find out what is in that bloody room. What do you think is in that room? What do I think is in that room? Um, a giant chocolate fountain, and he doesn't want to admit to everyone. Babe. Lockwood and Co. I am so high key obsessed with the show. And for those who are listening right now who haven't watched it yet, it's based on alternative reality, isn't it? Where the British public is plagued by sinister spirits and demons. And there was just me thinking that dealing with my everyday demons was bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I watched this, and I was like, Oh my god, this is an intense world to live in. But when you were dealing with those CGI ghosts, which are very petrifying, like let's not beat around the bush here, what were you actually staring at and envisaging at that point? God, yeah, it, it really varied, Josh. Like sometimes it was a, a crane with like, like a camera crane with red lights on it. Sometimes it was a tennis ball. Sometimes <laughs> it was like this... Um, big orb that had, I think it was for the S effect, like the, the special effects, it had, like it was a mirrored ball. And then most of the time it was this really lovely guy called Mikey, who was kind of, he's a puppeteer and like, he'd wear a green suit and have this sort of ghost figurine on like a stick that lit up and he'd be like dashing around the room in a green suit. So mostly it was that. <laughs> Stunning, I would love to know what he said when he went home from work every day. <laughs> So today I've been wearing a green suit, running around, freaking people out. Yeah, I mean, there are many great, like, screen grabs from, from those times where Mikey's, like, standing with a with this ghost attached, this, like, light attached to a pole, and he's just in this green suit. I did sometimes have to stop myself, but um, from, like, having a little giggle. Well, Lucy is such an epic character. I loved her. What did you learn about yourself through playing her? Um, Lucy's really strong, and I think... I, I don't know, like, I, I've always loved being strong when I was younger as well. Like, someone who stood out to me was Kat, Katniss Everdeen from The Hunger Games. Obsessed. Because all she cared about was being strong. And at that time, you know, I hadn't been, like, kind of plagued, I guess is the word, by kind of conventional pressures of society and beauty standards and the way that we want to look. And all I cared about was being strong. And I love that that's all she cared about too. So I, yeah, I learnt that about myself and I don't yet to be strong I don't know I keep talking about that word mm. has it given you like a new found love and respect for your body and your body image in a way in that sense yes um because I think you know once you do end up being plagued by whatever you know the way that you want to look or you feel you should look you I guess only end up getting more comfortable in yourself physically and mentally um, and with this role, all I cared about, well, I didn't care about sort of the way I looked, I cared about being able to do it justice in terms of getting really strong and the stamina and the fitness that it needed in order to bring these characters, bring this character to life. Did you have any mishaps? I imagine there must have been a couple of mishaps of that sort along the way. <laughs> um <laughs> I did actually. There was one moment I was stood in the cemetery and like Lucy lobs this sword and she throws it up at this, just up and she it goes on like this long trajectory and it's meant to be this really powerful move and I was like, okay, cool. Like, I was a little bit nervous, but I, I had it in hand. Um, <laughs> I've got um, this. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I was like, okay, cool. Like you know, pat myself on the back. I've got this. And the first time I did it, I threw it. And it just, it didn't really go up, it just kind of nosedived and it went straight past like like one of the grip's faces and it just, it hit the first AD. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I defo <laughs> like ended up like lobbing this plastics order at someone. Um, so I had, I had a couple, but other than that, you know, all good. Other than that, you had it in hand. I'm not sure, I'm not sure I would probably survive having it. <laughs> Like a sword, like, thrown at me like that. I'd be like, ah! Like, were they injured? No, no, like, every afterwards I was like, oh my god, like, did that hit you? Oh my god, but, oh, oh, I was panicking and Richard was like, no, no. Like, he took it super graciously. I mean, it probably, like, lobbed him in the eye, but he, didn't, <laughs> he was like, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> I honestly was convinced you were Northern after watching this. That Northern accent you perfected is 
stunning. It's so good. How did you how did you come about perfecting that? Walk me through. Well, actually, when I went into the audit, like when I did my self tape and did the audition, I went in like proper like Yorkshire, like Northern. God, I'm, people are going to be like, you're butchering this. What are you doing? <laughs> um, but I went in. <laughs> I went in like proper like. Well, we'll go, let's go to pub and I don't know, like, let's do anything like that. And then um, I think it was like the first time I met Joe and the, like Naya and Carmel um, properly, or maybe the second time that Joe was like, no, we let's just let's just pair that back a bit. Let's pair it back. What was your favourite bit of Northern lingo that you picked up? I remember we all ended up kind of like drinking gravy to like keep us warm as on night shoots. God, now I'm really stereotyping. Like, gravy's not a wholly northern thing. I don't know. <laughs> that, I love how you were drinking gravy to keep warm. That is a that is the last thing I would ever think of doing. So I'd be like, what's the thing that's going to keep us warm? I know, gravy. <laughs> yeah, give me some Vista, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the nichest diva demand I've ever heard is, can I get some Vista gravy to yeah, drink? Yeah. <laughs> you heard it here right first. Mariah Carey, eat your heart out. <laughs> Lucy does present herself or, and also feels like a bit of an outsider. Have you ever felt like an outsider? Yeah, definitely. I felt a bit like an outsider, a bit of an outcast. I think maybe everybody does at some points, especially, you know, going through school and going through secondary school. Um, kids can be mean, man. Like, <laughs> kids can be not very nice. Um but I was always one of those people, I think, I, like, managed to, you know, I was never a leader, but I was never, like, super on the outside. I was always just managed to, like, go under the radar and, like, just fit in. Um, in, in social circles, I think that's always how I kind of worked. I totally resonate with that. I was always, like, trying to find my little way in, my little box. It was like, I feel like an outsider. But then you literally fake it until you make it, right? Like, that's... And that's what she does, because she then... She then ends up finding her people in Anthony and George. When do you feel like you found your people? You're always searching for your people, aren't you? You're always... You're always looking for your people. But definitely, when I went to college... um, you know, I was really fortunate that I did find lots of friends that I love and really care for there and have stayed really good friends with them all. Um, I think when you find like-minded people and people who are willing to support you and encourage you and uplift you, those those people are your tribe and who you find a connection with. But, and oh God, it sounds so bloody cringe, but like, even you know, at work, I think getting, you know, I'm, so fortunate that I get to do what I love and when I'm at work I feel like I'm with you know people that you know I love and on Lockwood as well but I think I think as an adult like you're not you have to go searching for situations where you find friends because you know when you're younger you go through school and you're placed into school and so you naturally are in an environment with 30 other kids and you you connect with people much easier whereas as an adult you spend more time on your own and I didn't end up kind of going to uni so I didn't end up finding my like a crowd of people that way and I remember thinking oh my god how do, how do you make friends as an adult oh my god making friends as an adult is actually so hard and there's no like rule book or manual for how to do it it's a roller coaster friendships as an adult it is it definitely is a lot of people also recognize you from being in Bridgerton, playing Francesca in Bridgerton. I can't even imagine how difficult it was to leave that show. How did that come about? Because you left the show to join Lockwood & Co. And I imagine that must have felt like, oh, whoa, this is quite a big decision. Like, how did it all come about? Yeah, it was huge and not, you know, not one I took lightly either. It was very difficult, but... But I loved working on that show and I it was so incredible to be a part of like such a cultural moment and mm. I loved playing that character. I loved working and being surrounded by that cast and crew and the people that I got to work with. Um, yeah, and I just left college when I kind of got the role and I started on it and almost like the character I got to just observe, you know, the character she was constantly observing and I got to observe this like huge 
incredible spectacle and scale of production. Um, and I learn so much, um, and especially from the people, you know, the people around me who are, you know, incredibly loving and caring and welcoming and genuine and just like hilarious. Like everybody is like just hilarious. Um, and yeah, I feel like that role and that those people and that environment and that production prepared me to go and do a role like Lucy and Lockwood and Co. Have you had any funny slash disastrous job or audition moments before? I worked at um, like Wagamama, the restaurant chain, and yeah. I really enjoyed working there. But I remember like, you know, I was like 17, 18, and I used to work on like Sundays when everyone would have like a party on a Saturday or a Friday or something. And I remember one time I went into work and I was like, violently hung over and I yeah was like had this like giant knife in my hand like cutting a piece of chicken and I was like looking down at the chicken and I was like I'm still drunk oh my god I'm like oh my god, I feel sick you know I, I ended up getting through that shift but I was like never again <laughs> never again will I come into work like hung over I just like I'm not I'm not built for that like <laughs> yeah we do quickly need to talk about this because everyone is obsessed with i mean i'm obsessed with season one of Lockwood and co and it's only just been released but if you could be in a meeting room and you've got your own powerpoint presentation and you can decide what is going to happen in season two what do you want to see happen next i'd love to see lucy doing more fighting. Mm -hmm. I, I want to see her initiating more fights and, you know, saving Lockwood. I want to see Lucy save Lockwood and save George and um, it's, use all the weapons in the show. There are so, like, there are chains which George, like Ali, who plays George, uses a lot. And I love that. I think that was so cool. I'd love to see Lucy using the chains. Um, yeah, I say more fighting, more initiating the fights as herself. So Lucy's going to enter her fighting, her fighter era. Lucy's entered the fighting era. Yeah, she, she's learning. She, you know, she joins this agency and yes, yeah, she's got it all. But she's learning like how he works and how the agency works and how they work together and how she can fit herself in here and how to take on challenges and and all these things that she's constantly dealing with and then she's dealing with this newfound like power and it, it can all be I guess a little bit overwhelming so next if if you know if there is one or if there was one I'd love to see her kind of harnessing that and taking control Ooh, I'm loving this for her but I really need to know what's in that room <laughs> this is and I actually cannot believe I might have to wait another year to find out what is in that bloody room? What do you think is in that room? What do I think is in that room? Um, like a giant chocolate fountain. And he doesn't <laughs> want to admit to everyone that he actually just, you know, has this giant chocolate fountain that he goes in. And he's got a secret stash of uh, marshmallows as well. And occasionally he doesn't want anyone stealing from him. You know, he knows that uh, both Lucy and George love their cooking and love their love their food so he's like you know i've got to keep this one thing secret um no i've got <laughs> i've got no idea what's behind that no. <laughs> it was the last thing that i would expect to be behind that door as a chocolate fountain and you know what in this show you've got to learn that the unexpected always happens expect the unexpected you know he goes you want to see what's behind it and we all go <gasps> you don't have to if you don't want like he opens it and he goes it's my secret stash <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> I, I've got, I've got no idea, and I, I don't want to take a guess because I don't want to get it wrong. Okay, well, as far as plot twists go, the, <laughs> the chocolate fountain would be really <laughs> up there.